get going. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to um, we do have a small YouTube community uh, that, you know, likes to join in on, on our live. So occasionally you'll see me looking over here, just making sure that I'm not missing any questions uh, from the YouTube community that's joining us live. Um, but outside of that, I just want to make this all about you guys really understanding your story uh, and just kind of helping the audience put the pieces together and connect the dots on, you know, how they can learn from you guys, how they can, you know, kind of leverage the information and really even just put themselves on to something that they didn't even know exists like myself. Right. Uh, so let's start off with you guys uh, individually, like uh, Ty, I know that you're the founder of Dataflick and uh, Dataflick specifically helps investors and agents pretty much optimize their marketing efforts, right? Yeah, no, that's definitely the case. So we have two products. We have our investor product and our realtor product. So we essentially make predictions of who would sell off market to an investor and who would sell on market with a realtor. Mm -hmm. And we sell that data to them respectively, and they do various marketing tactics through it. So we kind of categorize it into three different pillars. We've got our direct mail. We have our direct outreach, which would be like call text, uh, things like that. And then we have all of our digital stuff as well. So people take that data, uh, they market to it in various ways to build brand equity and obviously get deals or listings. And as far as like how our system works, so we know, you know about how many transactions would happen in a month prior. And then we can tell you exactly how many we predict accurately on the list that we would actually give you. And then we just sell that data. Gotcha. And I saw that you guys are predicting about 71% of transactions. How were you able to uh, get your predictions up that high and that accurately? So, well, first we, we have a lot of data. So we have about right at around 1500 attributes per household. Mm. And that can be on the actual homeowner who lives in the house and the relatives and associates of the actual homeowner themselves. Cause like there's a ton of correlations that you can see, you know, across almost the whole family tree, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we take all that data and then we parse it out to say, all right, here are all the people who sold to an investor. And then here are all the people who listed with a realtor. And you can see very clear correlations in what that person looks like. So if you're familiar with Facebook ads, you know, like building lookalike audiences from customers that have already, you know, sold or, you know, worked with your company before, it's essentially building a very close lookalike audience of the people who'd want to sell to an investor off market versus who'd want to sell on market with the realtor. Mm -hmm. And if you boil it down, like we essentially take, you know, about 40 years of historical data and then parse that out and just make predictions. Got it. That makes sense. And just with you, you know, speaking on the, the data piece, you know, I, I, I'm sure many people will be confused as to how you can have like 1500 pieces of data per household. Right. And that that's sure. a lot of data. And most people are just familiar of like, you know, skip tracers like prop stream, if they're even in the space and stuff like that. We'll sure. get into like how you guys pretty uh, pretty much would be com com compatible or comparative to like prop stream and stuff that people Zillow people stuff that people are already using uh, sure. so that we can kind of make that correlation uh, a little bit later in the episode and then for you Andrew with owning 923 uh, Venture Studios tell us about the the beginning of that because you are responsible for creating over 50 products 14 different startups like what is that response like what does that responsibility look like having all these products and, you know, starting up these new businesses? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And we've been through an evolution. We, we don't build our own startups anymore, but we have gone through the adventure of building 14 of our own mm -hmm. uh, when we were considered what you would call a startup studio. Mm -hmm. uh, the responsibility of it, though, is, is when you meet people like Ty that really under, have the understanding of the market and the industry, you're kind of along for the ride, right? Our, our strength is really supporting a product understanding how that product can uh, scale and be robust enough to, to support the massive number of, of you know, cells and data that, that ties pushing through us. Um, so the responsibility is just ensuring that, that it's happening, right? And that our team is capable of learning the latest modern technologies you know, with machine learning and AI and database constructing and how we put that all together in an architecture so that customers of ours don't have to worry about the technology and they can just mm -hmm. kind of worry on their business. Got it. Got it. That's a huge blessing to be able to find a partnership like that and be able to f we're in the day and age where everybody is trying to be an entrepreneur, take take charge of their own time. And so that can be very stressful because not a lot of people know how to uh, relieve themselves of all the responsibilities it takes to run a business. So, you know, having a partner like, you know, 923 to come in and, and be able to alleviate some of these 
you know, other nuances so that they can really focus on the growth, innovation and things like that. That's a real blessing. And, and I'm sure, Ty, you can, you know, attest to that and, and, and kind of speak on that as well. But um, for you, Andrew, again, being a two time uh, Inc. 5000 fastest growing company, what would you say has been like the biggest uh, driving force to be able to have such an accolade like that? Uh, it's definitely the team. Um, we have worked really, really hard at uh, curating some of the best talent from around the world, um, not only from an uh, engineering standpoint, but project managers, QA, design, sales, marketing across the whole gamut. We have 66 people in house right now. Um, and building that team, you know, we've gone through hundreds and hundreds of members through the 11 years while we've been in business. Uh, but their abilities to take their thoughts and their creative juices and put it on paper and then, you know, be such a fun team to work with. That is definitely the reason why we've received any of the awards or even the customers that come to us. It's because of those members. Got it. Got it. I, I love that you kind of gave that that credit to the people. And, and uh, I've heard a couple successful entrepreneurs say, like, no matter what business you're in, you're in the people business. And it's just about investing into the teams, investing into the people. And it kind of comes back, you know, in your success tenfold. So I'm super excited to have both of you guys, Andrew and Ty. Um, and, I, and I love just what you guys are doing as I was reading up on your notes, learning a little bit more about your company. Uh, and I know our millionaires who are tapping in uh, and, and looking to grow and just finding new ways that they can, you know, step out of their current hustle, find a new side hustle, maybe turn that side hustle into a full time gig. I know that they'll be excited about this information that you guys can bring as well. Uh, so what's going on to all of our millionaires out there that are tuning in for a special live edition of the Million Dollar Mind podcast? on leveraging AI and machine learning in real estate. So today's episode is sponsored by the VIP podcast experience. You know, you can grow your brand, captivate your audience and unlock your message by supercharging your business with the VIP podcast experience today. So fellas, let's let's have some fun. And I, I'm really excited to, like I said, dive into this content. I want to start off with you guys origin story. Like how did you guys link up and get started in business with one another? I think it's a Google ad, right? Yeah, I was going to say it's very simple Google ad. Yeah. I mean, I, so I've been trying to like build our dev team out for a long time. So we have internal developers as well, but we realized pretty fast that we needed to be able to grow and just very quickly and very fluidly. So when you're trying to hire a lot of developers and things like that, trying to onboard them to understand your product and just be very flexible is super hard to do mm -hmm. just with how competitive hiring is now and things like that. So I was looking for an agency to kind of, you know, combine with the team that we already had just to scale really fast. And it was a very simple Google ad that now has been, you know, almost two years of working together. So it's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And so like, Ty, uh, you know, coming from you, what what are some of the things that you must have been doing right in your business to even be able to see this Google ad, receive it and just be open to, you know, hearing, you know, what the guys over at 923 have to have to offer? Yeah, I mean, we have a really specific like hiring process that we go through and we just kind of treat everyone the same to take like a little project to start with. And I think it was like a really simple like first website redesign. And I just liked how we worked together and then started giving them more and more projects. And now they're handling like the bulk of our really, really big projects, which is like things like data deployment and building algorithms. And you now we probably have at least 10 to 15 new projects that we're like working on from a features perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and for you, Andrew, with having that app, look, look, like the ad placement alone, it looks like you put your dollars right where it needed to be to hit like the target person that you needed to hit uh, for our, our listeners and people who are tuning in that are a little bit nervous about ads, whether it's Facebook ads, Google ads, since like what advice could you tell them on just like testing out different um, ad creatives, being able to you know, identify who you're targeting when you put out an ad just to kind of help people get a little bit more ease uh, in the mind of going into this beast that we call ad spend. Yeah, I, I mean, the truth of it from an agency's perspective is you always want to be advertising. Um, one of the last things you turn off is your Google ads. Uh, if you hone in on long tail keywords, it's some of the best fruitful uh, parts of your business because you do you do niche down as an agency. You become very good at a few things. And when you know those Google searches are returning one to two customers even a year, uh, they can be very fruitful for the long run. So obviously having one keyword out there, I think I've had it for a year before I met Ty. 
and just training the model to just continue to focus on the long tail uh, conversions as opposed to the word machine learning or the word AI, like I'm never going to win those. But if I focus on exactly what Ty is looking for or people like Ty, and even if I get one a year, it's still very, very valuable. So you don't see immediate returns and people turn them off and they give up. That's not the, not the story. Like if you're an agency or you're running Google ads, you got to find those long tail keywords, turn them on, curate them to very small so that maybe it hits once or twice a day, but uh, keep it going because eventually you'll, you'll get that exact lead that you wanted. Right. So it's kind of like taking on the mindset of like stocks, like it's a long term game, long term play. It's not necessarily something that is for the, the, the get rich quick crowd or the people that don't have patience or the people that, you know, are kind of spending their last, you know, thousand dollars on, on ads. It, it's not that type of game. No, it is um, very much so a evergreen type game where you you figure out what works for your business. You put some investment down there, and then as it grows, you kind of have to curate the negative keywords uh, and you know ensure that that you know process sticks. But you are going to be spending some money on it over the course of the year. Your hope is that you're calculating the return on investment, and that it's higher than the money you're putting in. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. So, I mean, what you guys have going on is pretty interesting because it sounds like you know from Ty's story, you know, like. He already had a business. He kind of stumbled onto your ads. Obviously, you run ads. You already have a business. So now just bringing these two businesses together, how would you say you guys were able to identify your need uh, or how were you able to pitch the value of one another to be able to form such a strong alliance? Yeah, go for it, Ty. So for me, you know, with tech, there's it's you're always, always innovating. So, I mean, there are so many projects that we have lined up. So for me, it's like, hey, if we can get this first kind of pillar right or this like foundation laid, we can build a lot of really special products on top of it. But we just have to get this first thing right. And that'll kind of open the floodgates. And I think that's a lot of like good advice in terms of tech too. Like a lot of people try to go really, really broad on like when they're making products but if you niche down to something very very specific and get really good at that that's when you can kind of expand to a ton of other products so like as an example when dataflix first started we were only doing just like raw distress data and that was you know what a lot of other people were doing but we wanted to have really high quality data just on that front first then we built the ai and you know making the predictions on just the investor side now we have a realtor product as well and we have skip tracing so you just like niche down really specifically into one thing and then just kind of build from there. So from the point of view of like working with Andrew, it's like, hey, let's get really, really good at this one thing. And if it goes well, then we'll build a lot of other stuff down the road. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So um, with you being a tech company and then, like you mentioned, also having like AI in the cuffs of the business, Andrew, I, I kind of read in your, your bio that you also um are like an ai machine learning you know expert you know helping businesses kind of really use these this this technology to kind of make the best business decisions moving forward so how did that look like with them already having access to like ai where did you come in to really make the biggest impact uh uh for data data flick um i can't I, yeah i think you all mute yeah, I think you're on oh, mute. Sorry. Ah, sorry. We've been in machine learning now for um, six years and AI is the higher family member. It's the hierarchy of machine learning. So a lot of the stuff that we work on with Ty is, is strictly machine learning. It's a lot of um, predictability models and trying to determine from the housing data that he has and all the data sources that are being input into the model, what type of predictions can we make out of that? And so for years, we've worked on different types of models for train systems and hydraulic systems um, that are predicting supply chains, you know, transportation um, and, and models like that. It wasn't, it wasn't until recently when generative AI came out in the form of ChatGPT, did people really start, you know, showing interest in, in hiring agencies to do those types of models. But if you strip back what, what GPT is, it's a large language model that is uh, really doing the same stuff it was doing last year or the year before, just in the public's eye that they can play with, right? Large language models are built into your, our Facebook feeds. They're built into Google. Um, it's nothing new from that sense, but the ability for uh, those those tools to now be utilized by the public, that's what's really eye-opening. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so when, you know, when somebody like Ty comes to, to nine, two, three, the whole part of this is we're nothing compared to what, what the brain power and the data sources are and his ability to kind of combine those two gives us the ability to create what's called predictive power. And that only happens when you have millions of data sets. Um, building that up takes a long period of time, but that predictive power that can come from uh, massive data, that's really when you can start seeing advancements in you know, what anomalies are happening, what houses are being predicted. And that 71% that you mentioned earlier can really only come when you have that amount of data. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, Dataflip pretty much comes in with the data and the 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 AI and 923 more so comes in like, okay, we have all this data. Let let us show you how to make sense of it all so that you can make the proper advancements understanding what this data means and and how you can use it. Yeah, and it's the partnership in in a sense of, you know, the uh, the product itself is always going to be a Dataflip product. We're just consultants. We just understand how that data can be manipulated or, you know, formed in a way with algorithms to create that prediction power that Ty's looking for. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just looping back to the the business use case that he's bringing to the table. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned that uh, the the thing that's eye opening about AI in now in today's age is how accessible it is to the public and everyday people. Is AI something that people should be afraid of? If so, like who should be the most worried about AI um, and how should people be looking at it to be able to leverage it for their benefit? You want to take that first tie or you want me to? Um, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> so I, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased, but I don't think anyone should necessarily be afraid of it. So it's interesting, all, all of the employees that Dataflick has we kind of took the approach of saying, hey, look, I want you to find and research as many tools as you can that can boost your productivity and make you better at your job. So I think we're a really, really long way from it just completely replacing people. I mm-hmm. think it's more of a a boosted productivity for people more so than a replacement system. And I think, you know, as far as like, like jobs that are probably the most affected, I think when I was first really reflecting on this like a long time ago, like five years ago, I think a lot of people thought it would be more on the robotic side, but I think creatively that's where the biggest impact has probably gone. Andrew, you probably know probably a little bit better than I do, but I mean, like, I don't know if you've seen anything about mid journey or generative AI from an imagery perspective, but you can, you know, do things so much faster from a design perspective now that, you know, is nearly impossible to like fathom unless you're really, really diving into it day to day. So, but, you know, from my perspective, I think everyone should embrace it and really just lean into trying to, you know, use it in your everyday life, like professionally or creatively. But, um, yeah, I don't think you should be afraid of it. Right, right. And, and I am curious, you know, to hear your take on it, Andrew. It sounds like you're pretty passionate on it as well. Yeah, Ty's exactly right. I, in the end of the day, what ChatGPT is and the large language model that OpenAI put out, and the same with BARD, it's a semantic comparison. It's understanding where things lie in a large data set and the closest comparison to that. So word prediction is the obvious one. If I said float like a butterfly, sting like a blank, like there's a bunch of text that's existed over time where that word is B. And I'm going to guess that that word is B, right? And I'm going to put it in the spot. And that's how uh, the ChatGPT works at a very, very basic level, just kind of predicting tokens. When you strip that back to like machine learning five years ago, there was a data scientist for translation. There's a data scientist for speech recognition. There's a data scientist for like animal sounds, right? And each one of those was like advancing in their fields. And what we finally realized is that there's only one thing that is in common of all of these, which is language. And when we start looking at how language can be interpreted across each of the data scientist fields, we can start understanding what can be predicted and what can be brought in-house. So there is a beginning point of where language models can solve for all of these long-term, you know, super sci-fi world changing things. But we're at the cross, like the cross it now. It's not that ChatGPT is changing things. It's not really going to take jobs because it hallucinates. It makes things up. It like predicts the wrong word and you have to edit it. It's not like replacing how we write, um, but it is giving you a, a, a secretary. It's giving you a person to assist you, just like Ty's saying. Um, But from the picture standpoint and the creative side of it, this was always the next generation of AI. It was always the first wave. It was going to be this idea that film, movie, and those things that 
take a lot of time, like a lot of effort to be put into to start giving the assistance of how visually can I get this out of my brain and onto paper. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's all those neurons things that you've seen now where like, I can show you a picture of a giraffe and I can run it through and like, I can actually map your mind and figure out like what you're thinking of and then show that you're thinking of a giraffe. That, that part of AI and that part of like predictive power of like understanding how the neurons work with the human brain and then reproducing that, that's where the advancements are going to start seeing people's jobs replaced. But we're just starting that now. Yeah. So, the whole little creative thing online and typing something in and getting a response is fun, but it's not going to, you know, replace an engineer anytime soon. Yeah, I, I definitely could see that. And, and and me using it, you know, personally myself, I can see that it, it the benefit is it gets it, it gets, helps you get an idea out of your mind, but it still does require a level of uh, critical thinking. Like you still want to look at what's being fed back to you from this, you know, this chat GBT or whatever server you're looking at and trying to figure out, OK, does this make sense for what I was trying to get? Um, but from you guys, from a professional aspect of, you know, this being your business, how, how else do you see that businesses and entrepreneurs can start to use AI to further advance their processes and productivity specifically, as I've heard you mention, Ty? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really depends on like the business or like what it is that you're trying to do. But like I can give you some examples of um, like how we've used it. So a massive thing for us is generating a lot of um, like summaries or when you have huge bodies of information that you're trying to get through and automating like processes like that's been massive for us. And research has also been huge. I don't know if you knew, but like or either. Yeah, I think it was last week when GPT-4 allowed for plugins to come into play and for web browsing. So that has really opened the door for us because, you know, we can take like large bodies of like 200, you know, page PDFs and do like summaries and build SOPs around them and things like that. So one of the things that I've been doing is when we make hires, I build playbooks. So it's basically building a playbook of whatever tasks that I was already doing to almost build like a standard operating procedure for that new hire to kind of take off my plate. So I've been using Loom, which is a like a recording software just of myself, like going through this entire process, transcribing that, putting that in the chat GPT-4 and basically saying, hey, build a playbook and an SOP list of like checklist style while building a step-by-step -step guide on everything I just said in Loom and clean it up. And then, you know, probably like 10% of the work coming in from my side on the front end and then it doing 80% of the heavy lifting and then me changing that back 10% just to make sure it's like contextualized correctly. Like that's been a massive time saver for me because before I used to have to write all this out manually and then do a video on it and then build the checklist completely by hand. So, you know, a year ago that would take me probably, I don't know, like five to six hours per like process, but now I can just do it in like 20, 30 minutes, which is mm. a massive and deal. You see the beauty of it, like the way Ty's using it has nothing to do with replacing another person, right? Mm -hmm. to get, he was getting stuff out of his head onto paper and he was doing it in a more efficient way. But mm -hmm. I can't think of another mechanism because Ty wanted to create that procedure, right? He would have to explain it to another human to then create the procedure. That human would have to get reviewed by Ty. He's just replacing the review mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying, this is an output that I have for my brain, my ideas. And that's where the assistance is happening. It's not necessarily replacing a downstream thing. It's just replacing the speed at which Ty can operate. And yeah. I right. think that's, that's where you see the benefits. Right. I could definitely see that because it's like you can make that Loom video either which way, but instead of sending the Loom video to an assistant and having them take a day or two days, it's like you can just kind of, like you said, transcribe that and feed it right to chat. And while you're still in that mode of thinking on it and you're ready to go, because even transcribing that, uh, whether it's a five minute video or a 10 minute video, how long does that usually take you, Ty? I mean, transcribing it, I used to never even do that because it just wasn't worth the time. So I used to just make the Loom video and then build the checklist and then build the step-by-step -step process. But now that I can transcribe it and get it perfectly accurate, it just importing it into like ChatGPT, like, you know, that's just a new process that I realized was way better than what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really good book um, called buy back your time it's by dan martell but we're that's kind of like the mantra that we, we take and approach but that's where i got a lot of these concepts too because 
you really shouldn't be doing like tasks that are below, you know, like if, so say if you're paying yourself $20 an hour, anything that's 25% of what you're already paying yourself, you should never be doing that yourself. And you should be passing off those administrative tasks to someone else because it's just a bad allocation of your time. And if you're a founder or like starting your own company or anything like that, you'll realize very, very fast that your time is probably the most valuable asset that you have because you can always generate more money, but you can't generate more time. So that's like the big value prop of like ChatGPT or like really any AI tool in general, I think, mm -hmm. which is kind of like the whole mantra of like how I operate from like day-to-day -day perspective. Yeah, it's like um, work smarter and not harder. Um, so we're able to get that power back and that time back where, you know, an average day of an entrepreneur, they could spend, you know, six hours working on a project with the power of AI. They're able to cut that down to two, maybe three hours just from being able to use those plugins and record these videos. Uh, Andrew, are you kind of also uh, using it in the same ways or do you have experience using AI in a, you know, quite different or other creative ways outside of what Ty mentioned? Yeah, so my in my lessons with ChatGPT right now in AI is really trying to think about enterprise and building for how enterprises can use this for the future. Um, because right now it is impossible. Like with the safety and security of an enterprise network, it is impossible for them to even use a prompt without having that getting sucked up into the public domain. And yeah. so uh, I've been playing around with ChatGPT, but I don't see the use cases yet where an enterprise can jump onto it uh, without creating that security. So my focus has been on trying to understand the language model from um, like an enterprise level, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, so that they can operate inside of a, a bubble, uh, have prompts that are organized by their company, figured out how those prompts can be sent to HR or any of those different types of departments that are inside their company without crossing over the, I, like the, the network IP stream. Um, so that involves, you know, playing with these different sets of tools like Hugging Face or uh, play, play, playing a lot, a lot with Bard because I do think Bard has an opportunity to move into that space. Um, but that, you know, the tools themselves, the things that I do, like from a very simple level, all of my phone calls get transcribed automatically, summarized automatically through ChatGPT, and then the summary gets put into the CRM. It's I hear that a lot on podcasts. It's not like innovative, you know, that much, but. Otter does it and a few others. And that's a simple way that I've created my own Zap. I just do it through Zapier. Mm -hmm. um, and I was limited up until, I, I was just talking about it too. I was thinking we used to be down to like, it was like a minute 30 that you could record your voice uh, with the 4,000 tokens. Now you can do like 32,000 32, tokens. So I can get to like 17 minutes, 18 minutes before it gets cut off. Um, but when they do the 100,000 tokens, I can finally do like an hour phone call, summarize the whole thing, store that in a folder. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's getting better and better. And like those little simple tools um, yeah. that you were talking about, like they are very helpful when you do utilize them correctly. Yeah. And now you, you mentioned that was, I think that was the second time I heard you mention Bard and yeah. um, just, I, I just know from our user base, most people only know of chat GBT. Like yeah. talk to us about Bard and any other uh, AI and machine learning tools that you have discovered that most people just don't even know about. Yeah, I mean, Bard is way better from a sense of research because it's real time. Um, so if you wanted to check out the Lakers game from last night or whenever they lost uh, the Celtics game tonight or any of those informations that are actually happening in a day, that allows you to use Google in that sense. It also crawls websites. So ChatGPT doesn't really know who's on the internet or what sources are on the internet, not yet at least. Whereas Bard, I can type in my URL and I can say summarize you know, my homepage then summarize my about page. Now give me the top 10 keywords that I'm missing on my homepage. And Bard will spit that out without a doubt because it like knows the context of the web pages that it's referencing. Mm. So once you start using it for research around real-time events or websites that you want to check out, or even like summarizing or aggregating websites, you can't go back to GPT because it just has that thing that's like, I'm a large language model. I can't answer this for you. And you're like, well, Bard can. And it's also a large language model. It just has real-time data. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if so, I was re I recently just used ChatGPT uh, to kind of redo the the copy on my website. You're pretty much saying I would have been had a, a better time or a much easier time doing that project on Bard. Yeah, it's eating up stuff. Like, have you heard of Jasper or Copy mm -hmm. AI? They're moving into this brand voice section and Bard is 
already there, right? You just say, here's, I want you to create a brand voice around this URL and it will understand that this is the type of language that's being spoken on this page, right? So quickly we're realizing that these, these models, this BARD model can actually do this type of brand voice or like talk to me in this type of style. Um, and yeah, it would have been way better because it would have understood what you've already said, where the gaps are and kind of where you should have put the correct context. Gotcha. So for someone watching that might have a uh, clothing brand, they they would be able to find a clothing brand that best speaks to their audience, say, hey, Bard or AI, use this website uh, and give me a brand voice uh, similar to this website, but for my own website. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. that is that is that is a gym that is a gym for the audience that I hope that they're taking notes and writing that down. I did throw it in the comments, Bard AI for people to just kind of look up and, and do their own research further on there. So wh where do you where do majority of you guys philosophies come from as far as entrepreneurship and being bit, you know, being business owners, you know, for the last six to 10 years? Wh where have you guys both gotten your philosophies from? Um, so I'm really, really big into education and mentorships. So I'm a part of a ton of different masterminds and a ton of, I probably read maybe like a book every two to three weeks, I would say. Um, I, I take a lot of different things from books, but specific, I had a really good, you know, quote from, uh, Vin Gang, if you know who that is, he's a, um, he owns a mastermind that basically talks about communication in general, but he, had a really, really good tip that I've used a lot where every time he reads a book, he takes the actual like chapter that he just read and actually has an action item from every book or, or sorry, every chapter from that book. And this is obviously nonfiction too, but if you honestly have an action item for every chapter that you read and you basically take, you know, and go on Amazon, go to four stars and up, as far as the books go, and then go in the niche that you want to learn about. If you read 30 to 50 books and take action from every chapter, I would almost guarantee it's impossible for you to fail if you're serious about it. Um, so like for me, I wanted to know a lot about SaaS. So I've read a lot of books about SaaS and I've done a lot of research on the topic. So you're almost getting like this kind of philosophy of like how you want to build something, you know, through like self-education and then you refine that education and foundation that you just built through masterminds that's kind of like how i have you know, scaled into this um and now what what is SaaS and, and what piqued your interest to want to dive into it so much um i mean i always have been a pretty like data heavy guy or data nerd if you will so i think that kind of fell in my lap but i was always really impressed at like what was possible with technology just from like auto you know really simple things from just like automating like basic tasks and just everything that kind of coincided with that but the big thing is like you know i think for a long time i've been betting on the you know big data ai or machine learning whatever you want to call it um or, but you know we were founded back in 2020 so this is a long time before chat gpt and i think there's a lot of people that are kind of popping out of the woodwork you know saying that they own ai companies or they want to like get into it now but um, I think it's been a rising thing for a long time. And like Andrew's been in it now for six years. So, yeah, the, gotcha. um, but yeah, SaaS was just something that, you know, kind of piqued my interest, but I actually got soldered in real estate and e-commerce. So I, you know, didn't start there. I just found out pretty quickly that technology was woven into anything mm -hmm. uh, and everything. So I just wanted to go to like, you know, kind of the source that was applicable to everything. Makes sense. So like your niche still pretty much stayed the same as far as like real estate. You just kind yeah. of got even deeper into that niche and got more specific as far as like the the software and servicing through there. Yeah. Like my first start actually was drop shipping, which is hilarious. But that was like <laughs> back in 2018, 2019. And then I, you know, took that active income, put it into real estate. And then from real estate, like learning that business, that was when I realized like how archaic and fragmented it was. That's how data flip was created kind of from there. Yeah. Now you said drop shipping was hilarious. We actually have a couple of people who have asked us questions about more about drop shipping. We've put out polls on drop shipping versus, you know, uh, wholesale, uh, retail wholesale. Uh, what, tell us your experience on drop shipping and why, why was it hilarious that that's how you kind of got your start? I, well, I, th I mentioned that the funny aspect of it, just because it's radically different than what I do now day to day. But mm -hmm. like the first time I 
like the first dollar I ever made was Shopify drop shipping. Um, I got into Amazon drop shipping, got into private label a little bit too. Realized you needed a lot of money to just kind of get into it. So from that point, I was like, I can either really double down onto this, or I felt like I could go into real estate and try and build like more like long term wealth, which is kind of like the Amazon private label model. Um, just building a brand, almost building like cash flow month over month. So I just wanted to kind of take the active income from drop shipping and then put it back into like real estate was kind of my initial thought. Uh, then I realized it was way more complicated than just like <laughs> that black and white. And uh, that was back in 2019 is where I really got into real estate. I spent a lot of money on masterminds and things like that because I was taking all of the profit from e-commerce and just putting it into that. And then I realized that you could, you know, like I'm sure everyone knows like the most millionaires are made from real estate and things like that. So I just felt like that'd be the easiest path to that, which is what, you know, kind of pushed me there. And then I felt like I saw a huge opportunity on the data side for real estate. And that's kind of like what pushed me into all that. Yeah. Well, man, shout out to you, Ty, for again, you know, creative and innovative because, uh, you know, me coming from a real estate background as well, I, I can see how easy it is for people to even get stagnant in real estate, you know, for just tr being, you know, starting in one space and then just kind of staying in that space, whether it's oh, I'm going to wholesale and all I'm going to do is wholesale or I'm going to be a realtor and all I'm going to do is be a realtor or I'm going to do flips and all, all I'm going to do is flips. You kind of pretty much taking the 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 responsibility of like seeing what else what more is there in this space that i'm in and how can i make the most of it so uh super proud of you for that and, and shout out to you for discovering what you have with data flick um for you andrew what, what have been some of the philosophies that kind of made you the entrepreneur that you are today yeah i'm a huge component of apprenticeship um i think ty actually i've, I've known his story now too he's he's been a great apprentice in his life as well Mm -hmm. um, but when I started, I was a mechanical engineer. I worked on nuclear submarines for the first five years of my life as an engineer. Um, but I invented a chip, uh, a processing chip for Bluetooth manufacturing. Um, but through that entire process, I had bosses, mentors, advisors, and everybody that was in mechanical engineering that kind of helped me through who I'm becoming today. Uh, and that's the idea of like learning and having this education and, and trying to figure out how to continue my education even after school. Uh, but really the books that, you know, I, I always seek after is a lot of the coaching books, um, you know, the Dan Sullivan's, the Gino Wickman's, people that have created frameworks and first principles about how to operate a business. Um, I was just going through somebody with a call before of the goal, which is a, a, you know, 1980s manufacturing plant about Herbie and trying to figure out how to, how to move, you know, supply through, a, a through move inventory through a supply chain. Um, but those first principles has allowed me to understand how business can operate and also creating the metrics and the financial metrics around how to measure proper success. Um, and so apprenticeship to me is really, you know, the foundation for what I believe in. I, I think you have to work for somebody, understand that like you're just going to, you know, Ryan, Ryan um, Holiday calls it painting the canvas. Like I'm just going to make them look really, really good. Uh, but in doing that process, you do all the grunt work, all the little itty bitty stuff uh, and you start learning over time how stuff operates, how it works, how it gets pieced together. Um, and both Ty and I are huge components of just basically hacking the internet, right? If you ask me to do anything, I can figure out how to piece two or three things together, use Zapier, use different types of tools, you know, mix data together. But that came from when I was an apprentice trying to look up stuff while I'm sitting on the job and try to figure out how I can be better as a person. Uh, so there's a bunch of books, there's a bunch of stories that you can read that kind of teach you this, this mastery of, of learning. And then once you get that knack of how to learn, how to teach others, how to, uh, you know, basically say yes to any challenge that's in front of you, uh, then you get the ability to be an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. once you're an entrepreneur, the world's your oyster, right? Where's your freedom at? How much time do you want to put in? How much effort do you want to put into those tasks? And you start seeing the compound returns from your apprenticeship, from the time in which you were sacrificing to be that, that entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think we should definitely go back into the practice of apprenticeship, um, because I think nowadays with social media, th that people are now so looking for the reward before they give uh, any impactful value, uh, which is kind of thrown off the, the, the scales of, you know, where people can kind of get into these spaces that they ha have a really hard time just kind of finding somebody they could study under. 
Um, but even now you see a swing from apprenticeship to like mentorship where some people are really just paying to play. Like, Hey, if I have, you know, a few thousand bucks, I'll just, you know, pay for you to mentor me. And even that is a little bit different from actually going in, studying under somebody and, you know, kind of taking on some of the grunt work of that, of that person, of that teacher. Um, for you, Andrew, what would you say, uh, knowing what you know now in today's day, uh, today's climate is apprenticeship something that uh, people could still benefit from as much as the, the, the mentorship aspect? If so, why? Yeah, I actually think it should go a step further and kind of replace college, right? Because the skill set that we're chasing now is very unique. And, you know, we're all components of, I think on this podcast, there are a lot of entrepreneurs are components of kind of uh, you know, making their own path or making their own destiny. Mm -hmm. But if you kind of have that figured out in high school, like, why do I need to go to a four year college when I can just be a plumber or you know, a real estate agent or whatever it happens to be, I can then get trained from somebody for four years on the job for that specific skill set. I don't necessarily need to know all the worldly, you know, all the different classes that you take in college because I have Google, right? And I, if I have the, the know with all of how to educate myself, whether I'm staying in that industry or moving to another industry, being trained by somebody from four years is the important aspect that allows me to like achieve my lifelong goals in that industry, right? And so you can always start your own business and really anything. It's just a matter of, do you have enough knowledge of the inner workings of that business by doing the work yourself first? Mm -hmm. And so if you are willing to sacrifice for those four years underneath an expert or chasing somebody that you aspire and say like, hey, I'll do anything, just, you know, I'll be wash dishes, I'll, you know, run around, I'll, I'll do your laundry, whatever it takes to like learn from these experts. Now you have the ability to like do the work, elevate yourself, and then hopefully assign others to, to do that lower level work while you can achieve your, your dreams. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even people should adopt that mindset when it comes to just looking for jobs too. Like I think so many people go into the job hunt, even just looking at it as something to pay bills and not looking at something that will interest them or is in their niche inside their their field of interest so that they could look at that job as an opportunity. You know, of course, you're getting paid for your time, but you're really there to look at how this business operates. Like, how do they have this these systems running? How do they manage people? How do they do X, Y, Z so that you can take those systems and processes and kind of duplicate it for your business? Um, switching gears just a little bit, because I do want to get into the, the nitty gritty, of course, uh, for you, Ty, as far as like how Dataflix specifically um, helps, you know, in the real estate space, specifically our realtors and our investors. Um, is Dataflix something that they could use for like comp analysis? Are they able to like plug in? Like how exactly does it work as far as how advantageous it is for a, an investor uh, or a realtor? Sure. So we're specifically focusing on the marketing process exclusively, and we exclusively work with scaling real estate teams. So this is not something that's super beginner friendly, just because our data is so valuable. Like we only sell it to one to two people per county or per market, if you will. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those people are massive, massive teams. So like as an example, you know, we have a, an investor who does like right at around like 40 to 50 deals a month, just as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some brokers that probably do like 30, 40 deals, uh, 30, 40 listings a month, not including like their buyer side at all. So as far as like day to day, kind of like how you would use Dataflick, it's all in your marketing systems. So we would say, hey, like this is a great example, actually, for a realtor. So we had a person sign up today. They inquired on five zip codes. And those five zip codes, we basically said, hey, you know, if we were to look at the last three months of transactions, there was about 268 of them. So from there, we picked, like we predicted 76% of the 268 transactions with a list of about 18,000 people. So from the perspective of like taking those 18,000, you're really just wanting to build an entire plan to reach them on every level. And I think a lot of outbound strategies are dying at the moment. So like as an example, if you're just calling and texting with all of the spam and like all of the AI tools that are kind of coming around that can make, you know, calling and texting more like scammy or dangerous for the general public, there's going to be a lot of backlash from carriers and just regulations that's going to be centered around it. So mm -hmm. from a company perspective, like we're putting a lot of effort into building outbound and inbound options. 
and things that really focus on building brand equity for companies, which is why we're trying to focus on companies that are just scaling as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like our size and things like that, we're servicing right at 240 counties today, um, just on the investor product alone. And the realtor product has been in beta for about three months now. Gotcha. Gotcha. So even on the investor side, uh, whether you're doing fix or flips or you're a, you're a wholesaling, or you're doing some creative financing at what point, like what problem would I be having as an investor that would uh, that would then make me be like, OK, I think it's time for me to go to those guys over at Dataflip. Yeah. So like every, the number one question we always get is like, what's the difference between like you and Batch or you and PropStream and things like that? So we've done a lot of tests about this, but traditionally, if you were to go into batch or prop stream and like one of our big test markets is Franklin County, which is Columbus, Ohio. It's really, really good market, you know, Midwest, very favorable landlord laws, things like that. So if you were to go into prop stream and say, okay, let's pull all of the primary lists, let's pull free and clear and absentee as well, and then traditionally stack it all together. So that list size is going to be right at around like two to 250,000 property records. And then you have to skip trace those records. You have to get the dialing platform ready or the texting platform ready or, and then probably direct mail the most, you know, highly stacked lists, if you will. So that same kind of mentality, you're going to waste a lot of money trying to reach out to all those people, not necessarily from a marketing perspective on the ad spend that you're allocating, but also on the resources of your team and your time. And like you could tell based on, you know, like what I said earlier, like I think time's the most important asset, which is kind of why we created Dataflick in this way. So if we come back to the Franklin County example, Dataflick's list size for this county is about 46,000 records. And that covers about 71% of the transactions. So imagine marketing to 46,000 people as opposed to marketing to two to 250,000 people. And when you can really focus on the actual messaging and like what whatever your exit strategy actually is, you can refine that even more. So like as an example, if you're doing creative financing, you probably want to focus more on the people that have interest rates and, you know, loans that are more favorable for like for creative financing as opposed to like a flip. So you can refine that list even further down and build strategies that are more hyper focused that actually build a brand as opposed to the Scorsese Earth style of like call and text and just blasting 200,000 people. Mm -hmm. so. Right. So, so the biggest difference and just trying to break it down further, Ty, is like the difference between that 200, that 250,000 uh, size list and the 46,000 is like my team would be more so more likely talking to a seller that is closer to entering the sales process as opposed to the bigger list. They'll, they're most likely going to be talking to a bunch of people who is like, Hey, don't call my phone. Not even here for it. Don't plan on selling. Is that kind of like the, 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 the gist there? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, if I could tell you like, Hey, we'll lower your marketing budget by 70 to 80% and you're going to get better results. It's a pretty good pitch, right? Yeah, It, make, it makes sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Andrew, for entrepreneurs who aren't as tech savvy, how would you, easily break down how they could use uh, AI for uh, their business goals? I think what people really should start thinking about is being a good prompter. I think that is the, the first lesson that, you know, humans need to learn here to start interacting with these models mm -hmm. uh, because prompting is going to be a skill that you're going to use in your job in 20 years. Whether you're a data processor, you're somebody running an agency, you're going to be prompting these machines uh, and so I think that's the first starting point. If you can understand uh, what type of language you should be using, how you should be directing it, what type of filtering mechanism you should use on the back end after you get the results, uh, taking classes and understanding that. I mean, there's high paying jobs just for prompting as well, but that'll really give you the ground floor. You know, I'm a huge component, component of first principles. Like mm -hmm. you'll truly understand how these models work when you're trying to explain to it from a business sense, like get me this data out of here mm -hmm. and writing the right prompt to do that will give you the hard lessons of what not to do, what not to say, how long does it take you to write the prompt? Where can you take shortcuts? Um, so I think that's a good starting point is, is becoming a, a good educated prompter. Uh, I think that's really good feedback. And to even second your point, um, unbeknownst to you, I started this experiment on my personal social media page a couple of weeks ago where I started incorporating uh, these carousels in which I would ask ChatGPT uh, Chat uh, a prompt. 
and I would just the carousel would be simple. Like I asked ChatGPT this prompt, and here's what I got, and then I would just show the answer that they fed me back, and it was getting a lot of a lot of traction, and I was starting to learn that you're right, people don't know what to even ask these models to really get the answers that they're looking for. Cause some people will say, Oh yeah, I tried that chat thing and it wasn't really giving me what I was looking for. And then you just got to go back to the root. Well, what did you, what did you what ask? You ask? Yeah. yeah. What, what did you, you ask? Um, what would you say that um, all the companies with you being at, at first starting as a uh, venture startup, what would you say all the companies that worked with nine to three have in common? Uh, good founders. You know, the the people that come to us typically have a good understanding of why they need an engineering team, uh, but also the the products we build now, we're lucky enough. I mean, at our early days, just like any agency, we built whatever and whenever, like anyone that would come to us would be like, yeah, sure, we'll we'll build that. But we've been lucky enough over the years that we're now moving into the aspect of, you know, series A and, and type founders that really understand the market, have a good product market fit vision, know what the heck they're doing, right? They're not like just throwing a thumb up in the air in the wind and hoping that things work out, they're actually building profitable businesses. And when you get into that type of building, that type of scale, um, the products not only are used by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, it's also creating these, these profitability scales that you know create recurring revenue to spend more on engineering, which is like a crazy thought in the venture world of what happens when you're profitable. Um, so I think the commonality is, is founders you know, really knowing that profitability matters and then producing a product that generates said profit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would you say, so what would be the, cause you mentioned earlier that you are, that you guys are stepping away from, of course, startups. Now, what would you say is the biggest uh, reason for the pivot? And uh, what would you say you guys are really trying to focus on next? If you didn't already <laughs> answer that. I mean, the, the simple answer is profitability. We spent a lot of money on these startups mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't have any venture backing. We've always been bootstrapped. And so to launch and run and fund our own startups was, was a challenge. Uh, so after we got to about 14 of them, we realized it's way more fun building bigger projects with other people, uh, but also it's, it's just, you know, it's a better business plan. We don't have to kind of curate our own CEOs. We don't have to figure out who's getting placed where. And, you know, is someone working on the startup today at no cost or are they working in the agency at, you know, getting paid for all of those challenges now have gone away and we've really honed in on building products for other people. And it's so that pivot is nearly a, a, you know, retaliation or a result from not being profitable and, and deciding that we've had enough and we need to figure out a pivot. Right. Right. Well, they say, they say collaboration over competition. You just said, yeah. Hey, less competition. Let's just start to collaborate a lot more. Yeah. Collaborate with people with better ideas too. We right. need to offer the best ideas. We came up with good ones. Right. And now, we have the option to select and choose and figure out who's right for us and what, what products have the availability to, to achieve greatness. Mm, okay. So this next question is for, I, I'm very curious uh, to hear from both of you on this one. And as far as from the, from the outside looking in, what type of value could someone bring uh, to you guys that would, I guess, have the biggest impact on your current mission and uh, core values right now? Tough question. Yeah, right. Um, feel the I mean, you can take it. Yeah. So we um, we're hiring a ton of salespeople right now. So that interviewing salespeople is very very hard, and kind of finding the right person for the that's a good you know culture fit, just a good fit for like what they're trying to achieve from a career is also pretty difficult to do. Um, you know, but I think hiring is probably the hardest part for virtually any business at all. So. Mm -hmm. And hiring sales is like doubly hard because the salaries are high and yeah. putting them into a business that you think you know how to operate and they were coming from another business that they were good at. It's like a hard mix. Yeah, I would say tech sales is probably like one of the most competitive sales environments for every part of the transaction, really. As if you're the person hiring, if you're the person coming in, uh, maybe besides medical sales, but you know, yeah. hard environment to be in. I would agree. Um, yeah. And like a lot of our hires to this point are all really big cogs because, you know, we're not quite startup level. We're more in the growth stage, if you will, like approaching kind of the series A caliber. So like every hire that you make at this stage is insanely important because they will interact with every single person in the organization. And if that person is slacking off, you feel that deep impact. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, that's just good. I think a good lesson for. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good, <laughs> good the good answer. Good answer. Yeah, what about for you, Andrew? So I kind of got lost in Ty's answer. What was the original question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, more so like what value could someone bring that would have uh, the biggest impact in uh, in your your company's mission or core values? Yeah, I think uh, we so we've gone through EOS and EOS teaches you kind of how to structure your business and how to do a hiring process. Um, so when we look at values of individuals that are coming in, it's you know being humbly confident always staying a student, like understanding how the business operates, being a great communicator. All of those are part of our values. And so we, we screen for that on the way in. Um, but if we had to, you know, outsource and look for the values of our customers, it's, it's really looking at those founders that um, are just easy to work with, understand the business, you know, have a fun product and, and kind of have fun at work as well. Don't take themselves like too, too serious, but also understand that there's money involved and there's profits that we're trying to to achieve with all of this. Um, but it's a balance between like just enjoying what you do for work and achieving greatness through products and building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And, um, Ty, Ty mentioned, um, uh, for him, it was of course like hiring, but you, you, he said specifically like sales, do either you guys have like, a like, a did you guys come from sales? What, what has been like your experience with sales? I can't hire for sales to save my life. I have <laughs> time hiring for it. I, I've gone through so many iterations of it and I'm back to just me selling again. Gotcha. gotcha. I don't know the secret. What about you, Ty? Oh, dude, I'm terrible at sales. I'm not that guy. <laughs> that is um, So one of my other co-founders, he, um, he handles all of our sales side and the other co-founder actually handles the realtor sales side. So I, I was selling very, very, very like early on in data flick. And I guess some people would argue like I sell when I come on like big podcasts and stuff, but really it's just, you know, talking about product. And if that's something that aligns with you, then, you know, try it out, but it's not very salesy at all. Right. Uh, but I think for us, you know, I've hired a lot of engineers, a lot of admins and just like a lot of marketers, but sales specifically has been tough for us just because you know, it's hard to find the right person that just aligns with like what you guys are trying to do mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a product perspective, from a culture perspective, and just from a workload perspective. Um, but yeah, that's big. Um, I, I think that's, you said it right there, product and culture is the biggest thing that a salesperson has to understand when going into a, a new role in company. And the reason why I asked you guys that is because, um, we have like this run on joke that uh, all of the all of the entrepreneurs that we've had on the show come from sales. So nah. so the so the audience kind of like thinks that they got to know sales to be the successful entrepreneur. But here we have you two having successful businesses, not necessarily having a sales background. So that gives them the hope. Uh, however, yeah. however, you guys are still even saying sales is still very important. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it drives like I think both Ty and I you know, probably have bring in, brought in some of the bigger contracts. Yeah, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I bring in the, the bigger contracts of the company. Um, yeah. The marketing and advertising does help and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, they want to talk to someone that knows how the business operates. And so I don't call it sales. I just call it like understanding what the customer needs. Mm -hmm. And if that's what it takes to bring them in to build a product, then that's what it's called. That's what sales is. Hey, if, they, if, that, if that's what you call it, Andrew, sounds like you're quite the salesman. Uh. <laughs> so um, you guys, um, th this question is for, for, for you, Ty. Uh, I want to kind of go back before we, you know, transition to the end of the show here. What new emerging trends have you kind of seen um, that real estate entrepreneurs who are watching should maybe pay attention to? I mean, I have a pulse on a lot of things that are working and a lot of things that are not working on pretty much ever, every like facet of real estate marketing. And I think if you're just doing outbound strategies alone, I would really consider trying to move towards building a brand just because that's going to be around, you know, from like a longevity perspective. Mm -hmm. But if you're just calling and texting and you don't even have a website and you're trying to wholesale, mm -hmm. it's going to be very, very hard to make that work. I think in the next 12 months. Gotcha. Especially now that you have all these new companies arising and people who are, you know, doing a lot of deals. So you just kind of set yourself up for being at the, the bottom of the, of the barrel, I, I guess, in that case. Yeah. Well, you said uh, some things that you that people shouldn't do. 
outside of those, what, what else did you kind of have or see that people shouldn't be doing right now in, in this time in real estate? I mean, if you're flipping or, well, I shouldn't even say that, but a lot of people are in markets that are declining. So I, there's a, I mean, no one really knows, but I think in the next 12 to 24 months, it is highly probable that we enter some level of a recession and that could be really bad and nasty, or it couldn't, or it could be just a mild correction. Uh, and you should really think about the areas that you're operating in and see, you know, if that's just like what is kind of going on from like a housing market, you know, reporting perspective as well, before you start willing, willy nilly launching markets and things like that. And um, just be very mindful of like where you're allocating your resources and dollars. Got it. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that, that, that feedback tie in gentlemen, as we are, um, you know, getting ready to wrap up in, in just a couple minutes here, I, I like to transition to uh, a, part, a portion of the show that I like to call red pill, blue pill. So have either of you guys seen uh, the matrix? Yeah. Yeah. Huge okay. Fan. Perfect. Perfect. So with, with Andrew, with you being uh, a, a huge fan of the matrix, like myself, if you could step into the shoes of Morpheus, for mm -hmm. a minute and give Ty a red pill or a blue pill scenario. And then what we're going to have you, Ty, is just kind of answer which pill you would take and, and why. Oh, wow. You really put me on the spot. <laughs> I see how creative you are, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And I got to think something that is you know, like the whole point of the red pill, blue pill is like it's a commonality that you believe in that like you have to then be folded the curtains that it's not actually reality. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess the 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 easy one to go to is is AI, uh, and I guess I'll ask like, in the next five to ten years, uh, how should I phrase it so that it's in reference to the Matrix? So in, in a sense, there's this concept that um, there's three phases of AI, right? Like the first step is that it's going to take over a lot of this writing aspect of it, this transform language. Uh, and things like that. And then the next years or so, we'll start putting information in the databases and start realizing it can start doing emergent technologies and growing itself. So I guess the last tie, like, if there's a world in which the governments and politicians and all that start stopping the trend, the trends of AI, would you get involved? Or like, how do you get involved? Or do you think this thing is going to freely evolve on itself and grow unblocked? from a governmental perspective. And if you had to peel back the curtain of if the governments come in and start trying to restrict this, um, how do you see that kind of like we're, we're in the world of government restriction? What world do you want to be in? In the one where the governments are kind of protecting us or the governments are or thinking they're protecting us? Or do you think it's better to be free and, and out there without oversight? A hard question, man. I know. I'm like, red pill, blue pill. I'm, I'm trying to think of like a scenario of this world. Yeah. So I think it is naive to think that there should not be some level of regulation behind AI. But at the right. same time, I think it needs to be regulated in a way that doesn't destroy the creative control that the people have in creating some of these things yeah, I agree. like as an example there's gonna be I, I i think this has already started to happen but like deep fakes as an example yeah. and like cloning people's voice like i i don't know anyone that this has happened to personally but i've heard of a lot of stories of people cloning someone's voice and scamming them by calling them with contact skip trace data and basically saying you know posing as that person right so, I don't know how we fix stuff like that, but I think at some level there has to be regulation to just make sure things like that aren't happening. Right. Also, as we're scaling and growing the AI side and machine learning side, there's going to be definitely some disruption from like a job perspective at some point. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be at least thought about and, and we have to have a solution for it to some level, I think. Right. So I, I would choose to live in a world where it's semi-regulated. There you go. But not too much where it destroys the creative control of founders. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I agree with that for the most. I, I would just couple that like 
I think these larger companies like Microsoft and OpenAI and Google, we have to start seeing where the data is coming from. We yeah. have to start understanding how are they predicting these things? Because right now there's a political layer on each of these systems that is from a democratic society that's based in California, right? Mm -hmm. And when you ask it a specific question and it answers, it's not always coming from just guessing the next token. There's actually a layer in there that says, if this question is asked, answer it this way. Yeah. And who's who's to say that, right? Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. controlling yeah. Google, you control the world, and whoever has the biggest pockets right now is going to get that power of being the sidekick for every human in their brain, thinking of these are the questions that they're asking and these are the answers that are giving back to their head. Yeah. That's when I, I start thinking that the regulation has to crunch down on these larger corporations as well. Yeah, and people have a hard time uh just thinking like that in general, because even before AI, like we're getting fed news and crazy headlines and people are, would much rather just take the headline and run with it before asking where yeah, it's coming from. That's a choice, right? Yeah. I can search into Google any sort of, you know, uh, conspiracy theory, and then I can just go down a rabbit hole, but that's a choice. If I search Google, I can see the top three hits. I pick the one that I want to follow down, right? If I'm just talking to a bot and it responds with no choice whatsoever, I'm no longer given that choice. I'm yeah. just getting the feedback. And that's where it gets dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a one hit wonder on each result, who controls that one hit wonder? Uh, I see your point. I see your point. Yeah. That was definitely a great question, something to think about and a great way that you answered it as well, Ty. So I appreciate yeah. your fellas, you know, cooperation and, and playing that little quick exercise with us. Um, the closing remarks for each of you, I would love to hear uh, just knowing where you are now and the things that you've learned the uh, you know the obstacles you had to jump over the lessons you that you had to face what would be some advice you could give 18 year old self if you were to you know run across that spitting image of yourself on vacation or or anywhere in the world what would you say to that 18 year old you you're much closer to that one ty <laughs> in terms of like uh just general advice to give to my you know younger self is that basically the question mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. So I think um, I'm a big proponent in just continuing to like move forward. So if I could go back and tell myself like, hey, you can do some really great things. You just have to be consistent and not expect results quickly. I think a lot of like the the headache and pain to get to this point would have been mitigated because I would have had that proper expectation to set to myself. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think mindset's everything. And I just, you know, in the last like four years probably have gotten that to like where I want it to be. And if I could have gotten in that mindset much faster, I think I would be exponentially further ahead now, but you know, it's hard to build that mindset without actually like experiencing kind of the pain first. Got it. Got it. Great answer. Great answer. What about you, Andrew? That's such like the challenge. And it ties so right. Like if I had to advise an 18 year old, I would tell them to go suffer and go through the pain of all the problems that it takes so that you can actually be successful. Right. But then again, you don't want them to do that and you don't want to give someone that advice. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is, is the same. Like you're never going to, like, I'm not sitting in this position thinking that it was easy to go from 18 to now and saying, I wish I skipped some steps. Yeah. Um, but I think that like road of like, really struggle. I mean, I've, I've heard stories from Ty's on podcast where he's sleeping on a bed in a 650 square foot room with his business founder, with his co-founder, right? Like that, that's the type of story that you have to do to know that like you want to be an entrepreneur. So do you skip that? No. And so I don't know, the advice is like, just stay the journey, like put the goal in mind of what you want to do. And I don't know, I guess 18 year old myself would say like, you made it eventually just know that the struggle is kind of worth it. Right. And I think we all have those like, you know, those underlying stories of an entrepreneur where it was a year or two years or five years of like just struggle and not getting cash in the door and trying to figure out how to work two jobs. Uh, but you can't skip that to, to gain success, because if you do, I, I think you will never get there. You, you have to go through the pain. Yeah, it's like adversity is a prerequisite of success. Yeah. Um, and we actually had one of our guests on another one of the shows we produce uh, pretty much say that, like for his kids, 
he had to pretty much manufacture adversity knowing that they would cuz not like he doesn't want to give them the life he had like he came from a totally different city different you know uh dangers in the world that he had to worry about so he doesn't want to deliberately put his kids in that environment but however you do have to kind of manufacture some type of adversity so that they're are still those lessons that they learn, you know, how to keep moving forward, how to be resilient, how to find solutions to problems and all those things like that. So, fellas, I appreciate, you know, your uh, again, your willingness to answer these questions and to be so transparent. If you could, I would love to give you this space so that you can, you know, plug yourselves in and, and tell our audience a little bit more about where they can find you and any projects that you're really excited about. Um, yeah, I mean, the easiest thing for us is like, you know, I've been featured on other podcasts, like Real Estate Disruptors with Steve Tring as an example. So like you can get, see, you know, some of that content, consume that if some of this stuff interests you. And obviously our website is there and probably the easiest way to reach us. Um, as far as like new projects, like, you know, we have a ton of stuff going on, so we don't have enough time to roll over all of those. But the um, we're getting as close to we can as like a done for you process. And that's kind of like where we're going from a company perspective, just to make this as streamlined as possible, just to you put this money here and you'll get these deals out. And uh, yeah, we're excited about it. Cool. Cool. What about you, Andrew? Cool. Uh, mine's nice and simple. Um, we love supporting founders like Ty. Uh, we bring, you know, second time entrepreneurs, third time entrepreneurs that are looking to build good products into our little workshop and, you know, it, it, it hopefully export out like a great product, a great team and uh, create some money and profit in the end of this so that people can come back and build more products with us. But you can find us at 923.co, all spelled out with the letters. So N-I-N-E, uh, then 23, um, all spelled out. And we're on Twitter and social media and things like that. Once you hit our website, um, you can see, learn a bunch about us and a bunch of our projects that we built. All of those new projects, they kind of come out once a month. We kind of deliver about two a month at this point. Um, so you'll see every month on our page, two new projects on the on the portfolio. So that's where you can learn about our new stuff. But yeah, it's, it's been super fun. Thanks for having us. Um, learned a bunch and and I appreciate you, uh, you, you asking all the questions that made us think a lot about both our business and ourselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, the, the pleasure is mine. I had fun asking those questions. I had fun learning about your journeys, how you started your your respective businesses and really uh very curious to see how our audience even receives you guys as well knowing that real estate and ai are both two things separately that we've talked about and i'm glad that we were able to put those two things together so much appreciation to you fellas uh and then much appreciation uh, appreciation to our millionaires who tune in every single week and who have tuned into this live episode you all are appreciated as well as you made this possible by giving us the feedback to even know that this was some type of content that you wanted to have so with that being said guys thanks in advance for becoming the change agents that you're bound to become especially if you apply these principles my name is kai speaks and we end in that live for now all right coolio appreciate